Hello everyone. I'm going to take a look at Now Let No Charitable Hope by Eleanor Wiley. <clears throat> we'll start with a little bit of context and then get into the poem. So Eleanor Wiley lived from 1885 to 1928. I don't necessarily think that her her own biographical details are necessarily intrinsic to our analysis, but a couple of things we might pick up on. Her own personal life was shrouded in social scandal, and this led to her being ostracized by her family and friends, her relationships with her family and friends breaking down. So she was a married woman and she ended up eloping, leaving town with a man named Horace Wiley, who'd previously spent time stalking her and who was 17 years older than her. And that was seen to be a scandal. Now, I think the reason this is relevant is we might claim that it is her being a woman that leads to this being so scandalous. The idea of a woman having an extramarital relationship might have been seen as more socially scandalous than a man for whom it would be more normalised to engage in that kind of relationship. And she talks about the idea of um, the difficulties of being a woman in the poem. And that is also supported by the fact that between 1914 and 1916, Wiley experiences trouble giving birth, including, unfortunately, experiencing a stillbirth. So the idea of the struggles that a woman experiences seems to relate to some of her own personal experiences. Okay, so let's go into the poem. Now, the poem is um, seemingly about her own personal difficulties. She begins the poem by rejecting the idea of hope. And that tells you that the speaker is um, pessimistic in nature. The speaker then explains the difficulties that she's had as both a human, but also as a woman. And then finally, as I'll talk about, she concludes that actually, despite her pessimism, life has granted her with some moments of joy and it hasn't been quite as bad as she's always expected it was going to be. OK, so we'll start with this op these opening three lines. Now, let no charitable hope confuse my mind with images of eagle and of antelope. So that first word of the poem is now, and it creates a sense of urgency and a sense of her interest in the, the present moment. Now, she rejects hope. She says, let no charitable hope confuse my mind. So she doesn't want to be hopeful and, and optimistic, and that tells us how pessimistic she is. Now, this might be based on the you know, her expectations might be based on her past experiences as a woman or just more generally as a person. Now, she rejects the image of an eagle and of an antelope. Now, an eagle is a bird of prey that sits at the top of its food chain, whereas an antelope is a is a mammal that is hunted. You might picture nature documentaries in which an antelope is is sort of standing, uh, you know, a herd of antelope stand there and you know that the lion is coming for the antelope. So she rejects the image of a predator, but she also rejects the image of a prey. And I think that's that tells us that she she doesn't want to be a victim. But at the same time, she doesn't want to be a victor. She doesn't want to be. She wants to be somewhere in the middle. She then, in the second stanza, or quatrain, makes very explicit claims about the difficulty of her life, okay? She says, I was being human born alone. I am being woman hard beset. So, you know, she experiences hard or difficult things. The phrase born alone creates this idea that even from birth, loneliness and struggle is inevitable. It's always going to happen. 
And then in the next line, she seems to relate that to being a woman. Now, this is where we can make the links to her own details. And the use of plosive alliteration here, being, born, being, beset. So plosive alliteration is alliteration of that P or B sound creates a sense of her feelings of resentment, okay? It's a harsh sound. It shows the resentment she feels towards this system that she is born into. Going into the final quatrain, I think this is where we can find a lot of the key language analysis that we want to do. So she talks about masks, outrageous and austere. So she talks about the years of her life wearing masks, and I think this metaphor tells us about her feelings about her life. It tells us that she perhaps doesn't recognize the, the former versions of herself. She feels a disconnection from her own life and a disconnection from the previous versions of herself. So I think that's a good metaphor for us to talk about, the idea of disguise and self-recognition. The two adjectives here are interestingly juxtaposed, outrageous and austere. Now, austere means showing restraint, holding back, whereas outrageous seems to be the opposite of that. It seems to be about something being extreme or flamboyant. So these two images juxtapose one another to create a sort of duality or a mixture of feelings about her life in the past. So what I would say is that juxtaposition shows the mixed feelings that the speaker has about her life. She says that the years of her life go by in single file, and that makes her life seem boring, seem repetitive. But not only that, but that her, those years of her life seem disconnected from one another single file, each year separate from the other one, one by one. And, and it creates a kind of fragmented sense of her life, not as this singular journey, this singular path, but as a kind of series of broken steps, perhaps. And then in the last two lines, we are introduced to this volta. Now, remember, a volta is the moment in the poem where the tone or the feeling suddenly shifts and a kind of answer or a response is provided to what the speaker's been saying. But, and that word but introduces, it's like the word however in an essay, but none has merited my fear. None of the years of my life have deserved the fear I gave to them. They weren't as bad as I feared and none has quite escaped my smile. So, Actually, there's a kind of final concluding optimism, and that's and that's created partially by the fact that the last word of the poem is smile. So finally, after this volta, we are left with an idea that actually there is some optimism that we might feel. Just briefly commenting on the structure, what I would talk about here is the fact that we have a very regular structure very regular structure and this regular structure is probably reflective of the fact that her life is regular the disappointments of her life the disappointments of her struggles as a female are regular are consistent the regularity of the structure is created in at least three ways one each stanza is four lines long so we have three quatrains so regular stanza length one. The other one is that we have this alternating rhyme scheme, A, B, A, B. Hope, images, antelope, these. Alone, beset, stone, get. To the alternating rhyme scheme. And then lastly, the use of this iambic tetrameter. So each line has eight syllables and the stress is on the even numbered of those syllables. Now let no charitable hope confuse my mind with images of eagle and of antelope. So very regular, 
meter there, rhythm is regular throughout. Okay, so I think if you identify the regular structure, it gives you a chance to identify multiple structural techniques.